uh, typical example of that, and, and probably the best example of the difference, is the word bachelor. A bachelor denotes an unba unmarried man. That's all it is. That's all denotation is. What's a bachelor? An unmarried man. What does a bachelor connote? Oh, some guy who lives in the marina, has a Lamborghini, has parties every weekend, has got a great wardrobe, awesome record collection, right? And all of a sudden, you're into this whole emotive. It's all about sex and desire. That's the connotation at work. And the great thing about language is, of course, that you can take a word like cat, and it can mean a jazz hipster, but it could also be a cougar, a, a lion or a tiger, not just a domestic cat. It could also be a caterpillar track truck on a on a building site you know the cat wrecked the house <laughs> well yeah it could be a caterpillar tractor right that's where the emotive register comes into play i think in the in the kind of gaps between the possibilities of what words and images mean so i think you're absolutely right yeah unlike my colleague who once wanted to bring us back to the intentional graphics i'm wondering if there's a way for us to unintentional graphic, the screensaver that seemed to sort of <laughs> punctuate very, un unintentionally punctuate varying parts of this presentation. Yeah. Right? In ways that these images, these sort of shaded doom kind of images shifting and moving sort of both distracted us from elements of the presentation, but actually sort of drew us more deeply into many of the logics, you know, adding another dimension of our ways of thinking about these yeah, that's a great point. The question was about the fact of the screensaver popping in and interrupting things um, <laughs> creates a whole other logic of narrative that's often unintended. Um, and I, you know, I think that's absolutely intrinsic to most experimental film, where they deliberately interrupt the, s the, s the seemingly logical action-oriented sequence of events. I mean, really done by someone like Jean-Luc Godard, who um, you know, I use the example of somebody getting on their hat and coat and going out the door, then appearing in the street and then in the back of a cab. With Godard, you cannot take it for granted that the person emerging in the street is doing it even the same year, let alone in the same sequence of events, or that the cab is in the same city. Uh, the guy who's the, the king of that was Ziga Vertov, uh, who wrote a manifesto on the idea of kino eye, which was an eye better than the human eye, because it allowed you to do the very thing you're talking about. You can take the eyes of, this, of, a, of one man, the ears of another, the feet and legs of another, and edit them together to create a man you would never see in reality, but is a super man for the, the new age. And you know, I think the screensaver popping on like this is, is like this, this gap that we could all enter into is this new ideal. <laughs> Great question. Uh, I, was <coughs> I was interested in that, that uh, word you used, fabulation, mm. which I've never heard before. But it, it's, a, it's very intriguing to me because uh, if I understand it right, is it sort of making um, uh, out of a, of a memory, a sort of a dead memory dredged up from the past, and making kind of a fable out of it then might be used in a creative way into the future, as maybe a novelist would take his childhood memory and then build a, a novel out of it, making it into a kind of a fable? Yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, talking about the use of the term um, fabulation and ha making a kind of new fable out of a, a, a dead memory. I was using it in the sense that Deleuze and Guattari talk about it in their book, What is Philosophy? And th they talk about fabulation as creating a kind of fable but that generates an audience that hasn't yet come into being because this image, based on this dead memory and dredged up from it, is sort of not ready for prime time yet. It still needs an audience to um, kind of bring it to life, to create a community that can really appreciate it for what it is. The best example I, I can think of for something like that is Muhammad Ali um, when he opposed the Vietnam War and went from being a sporting hero and a boxer to an anti-war activist and a black Muslim. 
who completely created a whole new audience for himself that never existed before when he resisted the draft. He fabulated himself into a new identity to create, say, somebody like me who loved him as a boxer but loved him even more as this new entity that I, could, that I, I felt had never existed before and love him to this day for it. And, it's, it, it, and it brings into being something that you can't conceive of at the time that you you've ha have it as a memory, but in a way only becomes real after the fact when you're looking back at the moment of its birth. And a poet or an author who kind of operates on that principle, uh, would, wouldn't he be uh, sort of at risk of having no readers in the present time, but maybe uh, after he's dead sometime? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, the question about the fact that an author is often out of his own time um, and ahead of his time, yeah, that is the risk, absolutely. And um, that is, in, in many ways, a testament to the fact that the, mo the world moves on uh, uh, to the point where the fabulation realizes itself. I mean, it, it ties in with that whole Hegelian idea of the owl of Minerva, that the... Um, Philosopher only gets the key insight into something uh, at uh, the, the dead of night when the owl has already flown. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of like the built-in contradiction of thought th and, and, and of insight. And uh, the idea of fabulation is, the, is a more Nietzschean one, because Deleuze and Guattari are very intrinsically Nietzschean, that you have to think like an artist first and foremost, and the philosopher has to think like an artist and has to think of ideas and concepts that answer questions that haven't even been raised yet. <laughs> it's a difficult thing to get your mind around. Because like you know, Jean-Francois was saying, it, it, it's playing around with time of which you have no real handle. Good questions, though. Yeah. Two questions. Um, this, notion, this idea of fabulation, what role does that play in scientific discovery or in engineering, and then what do we need to be able to do to take that and turn it into computational models so a computer can fill in that glue between the signs and make sense of it? Yeah, well, I would, I would say it would be absolutely intrinsic to, um, I mean, what <laughs> Disney would call imagineering, you know? <laughs> I mean, to give it a kind of uh, you know, pop culture <laughs> spin, but I mean, real scientists are imagineers. They ask questions that haven't been posed yet and come up with hypothetical answers that then lead them into realms of exploration that go simply beyond what if. I mean, Einstein must have done it with the theory of relativity in order to have discovered it in the first place, presumably, because you can't base it on an old model. So again, the, the, I mean, when Deleuze and Guattari in What is Philosophy ask these questions, they actually do them, they ask them on these different, what they call planes. There's, there's the plane of the scientist that they call the plane of organization, and the plane of imminence, which is that of the philosopher, and the plane of composition, which is the plane of the artist and the poet. And they're not all mutually exclusive. <laughs> and in fact, the true philosopher and the true scientists and the true artists um, find ways for those planes to intersect. And it's at those, I mean, this is so why it's so germane to this, this uh, topic tonight of interdisciplinarity. It's their meeting ground where the most brilliant things happen. And I think that's where scientists have to operate. Well, even Einstein couldn't deal with the issue of quantum mechanics. No. And he just put up his hands and said, this isn't right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, come. Yeah, I would like to uh, say that I, I think that what's so remarkable about this man is that, you know, <laughs> just, you know, it's almost impossible to imagine that you could give him any two images from any diverse direction and you could hold them each other. Yeah, Jean-Francois, you want to talk about some of your background and training and how you're such a brilliant draftsman, because it's <laughs> awesome. Oh, oh, thank, thank you. Um, maybe I can connect a little bit with uh, interdisciplinary uh, studies, right? 
<laughs> All right. Well, uh, it's well. Thanks for bringing this this issue. Uh, I I do use a lot of techniques on. Uh, on, uh, there's a gentleman here uh, uh, behind the camera, a photographer, a fine art photographer named Larry Shear, whom I'm, uh, we met about uh, th 25 years ago. Well, this, this gentleman in, in 1980 was already in computer graphics. He knew all the pioneers of computer design, and somehow he, he got really got me into it. He come, you know, and, and so I've been using the, the digital media for 25 years, almost. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't close to the microphone. <laughs> and uh, thanks to, to Larry. And I remember, well, this is an interdisciplinary uh, phenomenon in a way, me being a traditional artist doing oil paintings and meeting Larry. She was telling me, well, you should do pictures that way, you know. And they took some convincing, I'm, I'm sure, at first. <laughs> so, um, the skills I, I involved in, uh, in, in the type of images I'm making, uh, well, they first of all, I, I'm influenced by other artists. My father was an artist, so a painter, also an uh, abstract painter. You know, he did large oil paintings. Uh, closest example I could think of is the artist uh, Diebenkorn, maybe. And um, so he's a big influence on me. And then I, I'm, I'm, I was influenced by illustrators such as the illustrators who did the album covers, which were totally different, different techniques, and I was fascinated by both. And I somehow had to reach or find a way to... to and then I meet a gentleman like, uh, like Carm, who uh, altogether have a different idea of graphics, and graphic design coming from a totally different direction. And somehow I had to, to encompass that as well. Somehow I was sort of a huge uh, sponge of technique. I was fascinated by that, and I, I, felt, <laughs> I felt compelled to, to, um, to meet the challenge of doing it. It's, it was very appealing to me. Any, any technique is very appealing. Well, strangely enough, I, I find a lot of artists are masters in their own techniques, and they don't like to come out of it. And I understand that. Uh, on the other hand, I, was <laughs> I always thought that, that when I'm going to do this paint, this oil paint, and in two years I might be really bored with it, so I better start planning for <laughs> the future. <laughs> you know, that's a strong motivation as well. So, uh, um, so all along the way, I mean, I, I, I was interested in other techniques, and I did that through meeting other artists with a totally different approach about, about their work. So definitely uh, um, uh, interdisciplinary, you know, artists in a way in different disciplines. When I incorporated photography into my work, uh, it, it, it was a totally different way of thinking, you know. Uh, Ekam, did I answer your question? More or less? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. It was, uh, thank you. I should thank you. And not the, the <laughs> Uh, it's called obsessive compulsion. <laughs> 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 no, thank you, Carl. That's really a wonderful thing to say. So I think um, thirst has overtaken um, mental inquiry, so we should probably... Talk we can talk out there. And, yeah. and I actually think talking to Jean-Francois while you're playing with the, with the machines is really the way to go. So enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.